original. This is the pilot brace. You'll see them on the car, the other three on the car. For some reason, one of the four was missing. Originally, this was a bent piece of uh, one inch by four inch steel. And then, uh, so they would have had at the Laconia Car Company where this was made, they would have had a, a machine that would have, when this was red hot, they would have been able to put this offset in it and they would have been able to bend this end. But uh, for us, that's impossible. So we're welding it up out of solid stock. However, by the time it's finished, you will not know one way or the other. The steel is a little better. What they used in the old ones was wrought iron, and you can see the striations in it, as we have in some of the other pieces, where it was literally beaten to shape rather than rolled, as this was. So what our uh, technician is doing over here is he's welding it together, he's drilling the mounting holes, and um, it's almost ready to go on the car. These are motor support bars for ASL 100. The, the bolts that go through here that bolt onto the motor frame and then there's another casting that mounts here so that when the motor starts, whichever direction it goes, there's a spring mounting. The old ones were completely bent and rusted away to, in some cases, as little as half their thickness. So these are brand new, made out of steel. It's interesting, the ones that uh, Laconia made were probably from a special rolled piece of steel, but this was cut out of a plate five and a half inches wide, which is not a standard size. So they, where these came from, they had a machine that just cut this out of a big, huge plate of steel. So these are all ready except for painting. Even, even trolley cars have mufflers. This is uh, when the air from the brake cylinder is released, it goes out through here and makes it much quieter. I've ridden in a locomotive. In fact, on the uh, same route that this car ran, and I remember how noisy it was when the, it was a diesel locomotive, and I, but it still has the same kind of brakes, and I was amazed how much noise there was. So this uh, put the sound down below the cab, it was up, down under the floor, and also quieted it a bit. And all these parts have been sandblasted and primed. This is the end of a brake shoe turnbuckle, which also, I may have the wrong hand here, uh, which also is used for brake adjusting. If I got the right end of this together, it would screw in here, and there's another one on the other end, and these, uh, just like on an automobile, the older automobiles, it would uh, adjust the brake shoes so that they, uh, as they wear down, they fit more properly. This is a bushing that we put in. And I see a problem with it. I wonder if anybody else, is it my eyes? Does that look as if it's not round? <laughs> I shouldn't even be saying it, but it looks to me like it's slightly oval. Anyway, where there's wear, uh, you have a hardened piece of steel called a bushing, and then you have a pin that goes through it, like uh, this one. And that will uh, keep the casting from wearing. Now, somewhere along the way, this end broke off, so our machinist, Dean, welded a new end on it, and we thought it better not to take it down quite as close as the other one was to give it a little strength. So these are all parts of the brake slack adjusters, including some left-handed nuts here, which go on. You have a left hand and a right hand. See how the threads go in opposite directions? And so that when you turn this, one way will pull the the two ends closer, turn it the other way, and it'll push them apart, depending on whether you want to loosen or tighten the brakes. And um, one of the pieces of hardware, I'm kind of a stickler for this, most of the fastenings on 100 were square-headed, including these lag screws. And um, we want to return the car so that when you go underneath it and you look at it, you don't see a modern hex head, uh, six-sided, that you would find that you could gotten at your local hardware store. These are only made in limited quantities. So what we did is we saved the old ones. Some of them are kind of tough looking, but I think they're adequate. So they were pretty well rusted. And if we, we may repair the head or just put it back in if it's not supporting anything really, really critical. So these are all miscellaneous castings, parts for the bolster, uh, pins for the brakes. I'm not sure we'll use this one again. 
person that sandblasted it just did everything I told him, maybe. Uh, and uh, these are slide plates for a bolster. Uh, and uh, what else have we got here? This is the air intake for the air compressor. It's filled with horse hair, and then there's a screen over here to keep it from pulling out. So the air goes in here and goes into the air compressor. If you don't have a screen here, it's going to suck in dirt and so forth, and that will uh, introduce grit to uh, the piston rings and wear the thing out. So apparently this had a hard time at some point during its life because this, or else they made it, uh, adapted a, it to a different location because the compressor that is in 100 is not the original and they probably took one from somewhere else maybe some other car or they bought it second hand or whatever and they well brazed this on to, for a different configuration this is a, a sander so on the car there'll be a sort of a hopper here and the sand will pour down in here but there's a little baffle right here that keeps it from just falling down and going right out. When you push, blow air through here, it pushes the sand up and over and it falls out and goes down through this steel hose, which we painted and it's kind of stuck, uh, and that'll go on the track. And that's used for when the weather is uh, damp on a damp morning or in the fall and there are leaves on the track and that sand provides just enough grit so the locomotive can get traction. This is a step bolt, which is quite often used in trolley construction. If you have a wooden post up here, it's hard to fasten to the end if it goes into a tenon on the, the or the, if it has a tenon, I'm sorry, that goes into a, a piece of wood here. So what you do is you cut a little mortise for this in the side of the post, put this in, bolt it to it, and then this will go down to the bottom of whatever piece of wood is going this direction and it's pulled up with this bolt. Now this will probably weld a new bolt on here. But this is original, formed on a, by hand, probably on a blacksmith, somebody pounding it away, pounding it over a, something, and you can see the old the striations in, if you look hard enough anyway, in this showing that it's not the modern day steel. Uh, and there are, it was all pounded to shape, and we find that this grain will sometimes separate this is very different looking from modern steel. One of the reasons we want to save it, even though it may not be quite as strong as the original, it, it was overbuilt anyway, so we have plenty to go on. There's another one you can see a little bit better, some of the striations. Uh, some of these we're going to have to make because they've disappeared or were rusted away, but we have enough to uh, go by. This big pit here was uh, formed by rust, which we've sandblasted out or chipped out and so uh, it's uh, kind of changed its cross-section but it's still plenty adequate for what we're going to do. This is a piece of the truck which was, uh, there's a pin that goes through here that uh, helps uh, hold the truck together and um, it had cracked, let's see what had cracked on here I think this end had cracked off and they welded it up, uh, welded a new piece on here. And they welded up here where it had cracked also. So it's ready to go. Here's another one, I guess. These are part of the handbrake mechanism. These clevises hook onto um, arms or levers that are underneath the car. And uh, again, this is all hand forged, hand blacksmith. There's a, a forge weld right here. I don't know whether you can see that or not. But right here, that you can see a line where this this was heated red hot and this was heated red hot. And by the process of banging on it with a hammer, they were able to make a weld here that the, the molecules of one half went into the other. And uh, it's quite solid there. You can see it on this side right here. Um, a good reason to preserve these is because something like this is just, uh, well, I suppose you could find some old blacksmith somewhere that might be able to make it, but it would be pretty pretty rare. And so we try to preserve the original part. And then all this chain was formed in some primitive manner that I don't know know about. Well, we, uh, there's one we're probably going to either weld a new one on or replace that. You can see the weld going right down through there. 
So I think that's all. As air brakes, and the air brakes are connected together with different sizes of pipe. This is all Schedule 40 pipe, which is standard good for 150 pound. Uh, they did not use galvanized pipe in general. They used um, just plain what they call black iron pipe, and that uh, coating has gone off. And so it rusted to the point we didn't feel it was safe. So with the exception of very few small pieces, we've replaced all the pipe, and this is now scrap. Uh, also, there's this, uh, a lot of wire, uh, which we are only saving a little bit of just to show what it was. Now this is kind of interesting, the type of, some of the work that was done on that car was a little bit primitive. Here's a splice. This is, this is a ground wire, fairly substantial. went from one end to the other. All the uh, current from anything, the motors, the lights, the compressor, had to go through the ground wire and then it was attached to the car bolsters which then conducted the electricity to the track and there, from there it went on to the, or back to the uh, power station. Well anyway, some circuit, and I think it was either the headlight or the heaters, was attached with this very simple, very ineffective splice, just wrapped, this is heavy solid wire, not flexible at all, or to any degree, and uh, was just not, I think it was something they must have done at the very, very end when they uh, were running out of money, which is something they were doing all the time, I guess. And they just wrapped the wire around. Now what we will do is we'll do what they did originally on the car, is a T-splice, and it'll be soldered, and there'll be much more wrapping around. It'll be uh, much more, much conduct the electricity much better and more dependably. I don't know whether I'm and these are just various pieces of wire. We found one of them that had gotten very hot. This had all, all the insulation had burned off the wire here. And there's some that's, it's a rubber wire, rubber covered with cotton covering over that. And this wire had gotten very hot. We don't know why, but uh, the car ran into the shop. So it was working up until the last minute anyway. Okay. And this is this is the motor control wiring for ASL 100. It was all held in under the car uh, in various ways. Uh, the wire is uh, rubber covered, cotton covered wire, stranded, seven strand wire. Uh, this is I think a number six wire and I've just separated the strands so you can see. This wire uh, is, has an advantage that you can bend it around places and it stays there. The more modern flexible wire, you can't, it won't stay. Uh, this, the, the stiffness, it makes it a little hard to install, but as you're putting it into places and want it to go on a roof, it will stay there quite nicely. We're using the same kind of wire, again, as was here. Uh, the reason we didn't use this again, as you'll see, partly because of the condition it was in, but also because it, uh, it's 100 years old to begin with, and it probably, some sections of it would be all right, but you don't want to start with wire that's 100 years old because the rubber does disintegrate. Uh, one of the reasons, the other reason we're replacing it is because it's such a mess. It's had fires, it's, uh, there are pieces that are cut in and out. I'm going to show you a splice in a second here, and it just, um, was a mess, and copying it, which I had wanted to do, would have been impossible, and we would have been copying some rather marginal stuff. Now maybe we should, because that's the way they were, the Atlantic Shoreline, in the last few weeks or years, whatever it was that it took to keep them going. We know there were some, at least two fires in it, because uh, we've seen them, and we've seen where they were patched up. Now, for some reason, they needed a piece of wire this long, so they used this set screw type connector here, which is a a brass tube with screws on the side to hold that. And we will continue to use these connectors to hold the motors on, but we won't use short sections of wire like that because um, it's really just not good. Now this was wrapped with a material called cambric tape, which is a bias tape that is the, the instead of being woven on a, well it is woven on a right angle, but when it's cut, it's cut at an angle and that keeps it from unraveling. And I can see an inner layer here 
where we would use vinyl tape in 2008. They used this vinyl tape, which was pretty good stuff, but it doesn't have an adhesive and it, it doesn't wrap evenly, easily. And then they either would put rubber tape or uh, just wrap it directly with friction tape, which is what you see here. And I just peeled this off so we could see what the connector was, and frankly, we'll, we'll recycle that and use that connector again. Uh, I do nowadays put vinyl tape over first, but what you see will be the friction tape uh, on all these joints, just as they were original. Now, for some reason, they put this kink in here and held it together with friction tape. I have no idea why they did that. Here are a bunch of other splices where they uh, lengthened the wire out for some reason. I don't, I don't know what they're like in here. This doesn't feel like they've got screws on it. There's no uh, bumps as there would be like this. So there may be just a, a bronze tube soldered together or they may have wrapped the wire around each other. Now they, the way these, uh, the wire was uh, bundled was it was either wrapped in friction tape, as you see right here. Well, there's probably cambric tape underneath that. I, we haven't opened this up, but I'm pretty sure there is. And or hose that they put around. This is fire hose. It doesn't have a rubber lining, uh, but they did make this hose specifically for this electrical purpose, and we will try to use that, though it's a little difficult where we're coming in on this in the middle rather than starting from scratch to be able to put this over the wires and have it go where you want, but we will use it as much as we can. Interestingly, also on the wire, I just saw it here, there was a tag that would have been stamped as to where this wire would have gone. What did I do with it? It was in the middle of all this bundle. But you see how I'm twisting it. Uh, I'm, you can look right through it to the, uh, to the copper here, and there's, uh, the rubber has disintegrated, and the, the frayed cotton is not critical, but it it's, uh, doesn't look very nice. So. This wire has had it, and it will be sold for scrap to maybe help pay for a little bit of this work here. So anyway, you have the um, the hose and the friction tape, which is all dried out, and this is a big T splice. Uh, where the, and I'll see if I can find a T here. Uh, I had it set aside earlier for illustration, but I can't find it now. Basically, it's just. You take the stranded wire, you have the straight ahead wire, you bear that for about this long. The stranded wire you open up and splay out all the seven strands and then you wrap them around very nicely on both directions so that you get what they call a Western Union splice, which is basically a T. You've got the branch wire and the through wire here and then you solder that and that is very, very solid and won't go anywhere and then you uh, tape that all up and it's just fine. Uh, they make modern connectors, a thing called a hug a bug, uh, or no, a, a hug a bug is what covers it. It's a split, a split bolt burndy connectors, they call them, which is what they would do nowadays. Some places nowadays would use a, a crimp connector, but we're not going to use any of those because they weren't used at any time during uh, 100's life. And it was 1948 that the car last ran, and how much work they actually did it in that time is probably very, very little. So, I th what you're looking at now are the ends of the air pipes that go to the various things that are above deck. This big pipe, which will swing across when we finally finish with it, is where the air compressor will put its air out and through this big pipe, and then it goes down, around to the end of the car, and back, and into the first main reservoir, what we call the wet reservoir. And the reason there's all this extra pipe is this acts as a radiator to cool the air so that any moisture in it ends up in the reservoir and, and condenses out and doesn't end up getting in the brake cylinder, brake system I should say. There's a check valve up on here which will keep the air from leaking back through. You don't normally see those but I bet the compressor toward the end was kind of leaky and its valves were leaky, so this was just an extra way of keeping any air leaking back through the compressor when it wasn't actually running. Moving a little bit ahead, you see two of the three pipes that go to the motorman's brake valve. This is a double-ended car, so you had a brake valve on either end of the car. 
And we have these sticking up through right now because we want to uh, lay the floor out and we want to make sure that there will be provision in the floor, holes, so for the brakes, uh, pipes to come through. And we needed to know just where they came up. So we've set them on here and then we're going to take them off when we actually lay the floor or the deck of the car. And then they'll be, we can just screw them right straight down into the pipes where they go. The other end, you can actually see the motorman's brake valve on there, the engineer's valve, as they call it, with its three pipes. One is called the train line, one is called the exhaust, and the other is called the brake pipe. And uh, then the device coming toward us a little bit is the feed valve. The, the uh, actual air that goes through the brake valve is at a lower pressure than what is uh, coming out of the air compressor. It's a difference of 115 down to about 85, I think, and I'd have to check those figures to be sure. And anyway, that feed valve is a reducing valve. Now, the way that's piped, uh, I'm sure it wasn't original. The way we piped it is copying, more or less, what was there when we found it. And I think they put the, the uh, feed valve inside, which is right next to the stove, because they probably had some freezing problems with it. Originally, it was probably mounted either closer to the floor or even down underneath the floor. And uh, this is the way we found it, so that's the way we're going to put it back. Again, we will take that out because the cab, which is way down beyond the car, has got to slide over so that the, this end of it ends up way up here. And it's, it's, in order to go over these pipes, we're going to have to take them off. This one we won't because the cab doesn't come out that far. The hoods are built over here. We, those are separate entirely. Now we can uh, look at the, hood. the sander. We'll have the little uh, a hopper up overhead that contains the sand. Here's the air pipe that connects to it that blows when there's a valve inside of the cab. We didn't pipe it in, uh, the, in yet, but it will hook up to here and then blow the sand down through and down and onto the track. What we call sill number seven. There are eight of them all the way across, and this is the one number seven of eight. You can see the patches which we used in the epoxy to fill up all of the cracks and crevices because this is essentially exposed to the weather. On top of this, the deck will go at 90 degrees, but it's not perfectly tight, so air can get, or water can get down in there and can uh, rot away the wood, as it did. Now, all of the other sills have new tops on them to one degree or another. I think up here, everything does. And the outside ones are totally new, that is, new recycled wood. So. Uh, they didn't need it, but this number seven sill, for whatever reason, uh, seemed to be, and I, we, we kind of favored it, to, we tried to keep it all original. The bottom has some problems with it, but uh, it's solid enough for our purposes. There's a few holes that we didn't catch, uh, and I'm going to just put a little putty in those. And then, one thing we noticed when I scraped these a while ago, that there was a white paint, and we found it dribbled over the side of the sills, so they must have painted the sills first with this uh, barn red paint. And then at some point, to protect these, they put on them. And so we're going to use a white enamel, but it'll give the same appearance, and I'll see if I can have some authentic dribbles over the side, which is something that's pretty easy to do. I don't know how easy it'll be if you don't want it, if you do want it, rather. You see these? Mm -hmm. uh, and they, that's def definitely made with a chisel. There's one here, and there's another one here, and another one here. As we were filling these sills here, we sanded off all of the old original paint, and uh, I noticed these marks which were incised with a wood chisel, and they're about the same distance apart as uh, the, the deck boards, which will go all the way across. And I have a feeling that they were used when they put the pieces, the tongue and groove wood, on here, they would nail one down, and then the next one they would hammer together, and then they would drive a chisel into the wood and use it to lever the wood tight together. Now, interestingly enough, we're wondering how effective that was, because when we finally found this floor a hundred years later, there had developed spaces as much as a half an inch between every board. And uh, what we think was that the wood was soaking wet 
not dried at all when they put it on and that they had put it up tight but as anybody who has built decks with wet lumber knows that they will find that the things shrink up so that's probably what happened so I'm, I'm theorizing that these marks were used to put it together as tight as possible and then they must have been in a real rush to uh, get this car out of there not using seasoned wood and it gradually dried up now the wood that we're using these two are new pieces are thoroughly seasoned they were uh, from a build, building that was taken down that was built probably a hundred years ago at least and um, they were they had cracked already they have warped to whatever degree they were going to and the cracks in them have are as big as they're ever going to be and we fill them and we know that they will be stable so the car will be more stable it was than when it came out of the Laconia car company uh, and this is where a 3x3 three three sill will go that actually holds the cab down through some of these will be a, a rod that is bolted underneath this sill here up through and it'll go right up to the roof of the cab. The three of those that they see. I guess it'll be here. Yeah, there'll be one out here, one here, one there. I don't have to get that. Uh, the number one motorman's valve next to the main reservoir, the dry reservoir, the second reservoir. Uh, this is a pipe that feeds air to the auxiliary. Uh, circuits of the car. It goes to the whistle, to the sander valve, and it also goes up to the feed valve, which you can see upstairs there, and then it go, comes back down from the feed valve and goes back to the you know, auxiliary reservoir and the triple valve. Uh, this is kind of a rat's nest of pipes in here. When we took it apart, we wondered if we'd be able to get it back together again, but it turned out without the floor there and so forth, we were able to do it and we hope it's right. This little uh, device right here is a safety valve. This will blow off if the air compressor doesn't stop and the air continues to flow into the system. Uh, normally they're not located in such a, a hard to get at place but this is where it was originally and then all these pipes flow to the various uh, I suppose I should put arrows and labels on them just for our own sake because when you look at it, it just looks like a bunch of pipes, but they all have certain connections. One thing is that everything starts here and then goes back to the other end. Uh, this is a pipe that feeds the sander and the whistle on the other end. Uh, and then uh, this one goes to the train line and there's a pipe that goes the entire length of the locomotive and then goes to other, uh, to other cars in the train. Another thing, to, well, let's show the pipes, I guess, here. Uh, looking around that there is a pipe overhead here is the brake pipe and you can see it going off into the distance goes over to the other side and goes out to what they call a glad hand which then would connect to the next car on the train and then behind us it goes the same direction to the to the other end the locomotive can couple in other words on either end to uh, to a car and this goes over to the triple valve which is what actually sends the air into the brakes of the train from that uh, auxiliary reservoir which is in the background. These are the various brake levers. This one is the, the live lever. Uh, the brake cylinder piston pushes this out and then it will pull from here. There will be a rod that goes back to a truck and that's what actually pulls on this end and then because of this, the way it's pulled to get, uh, put together with this uh, turnbuckle in between, it will also pull in the other direction with this other lever. Up above is the handbrake uh, lever, which it works in emergencies, and it will also operate these levers. Uh, looking up overhead are some interesting bits of history, which we're not quite sure of. This one is pretty obvious. That pulley is. Uh, part of the handbrake mechanism. The chain goes from a shaft here over around that pulley and connects to the, the handbrake lever. But at some point they must have pulled too hard on it and it ripped right out of the wood so they moved it to a different place and we, this is where we put it back. 
Uh, the same thing happened to the pulley on the other end. But then there are these other mysterious holes. There's something here, we don't know what it is. Something was bolted here. Uh, there's one possibility, turning around, well, there's a few more holes here. Uh, the original air compressor was mounted right here. And there's one of the mounting, where one of the mounting brackets would have been, and the other was here. Uh, eventually, they moved the air compressor up under one of the hoods. And there would have been, there's a possibility that this had something to do with the mounting of that. We don't know. Uh, this pipe is now here because this reservoir is one foot longer than the original. We didn't have one of the 48 inch length. We had to go to 60 inches. So this pipe uh, would normally not have been here. It would have been back here. You can see the holes where the, this bracket would have been if we had been able to copy that. But we just have a little more air capacity. You notice these seals are now all painted with a protective coat of stain, which is the same color as the original. There are a lot of holes in it because the wiring was nailed to all of these seals that ran along through here and then across back through here. And we pulled every one of those nails out. They were just large-headed shingle nails around, but just ordinary roofing nails, no screws or anything like that, through leather straps fastened here, and then there was some, on the single wires, there were little brass straps. Well, we saved all the brass straps because they don't make them anymore, and we'll be able to use them uh, when we rerun re the wires. We took all the wires out completely so we could properly paint this, and then we will put them back in the same roof, but they'll be a lot neater than they were when we started. We are behind the coupler, and the coupler is mounted in, fastened onto the car in two ways. Up above is this rod which runs from one end of the locomotive to the other. It's one inch, inch and an eighth rod, inch and a quarter rod, I should say, with uh, nuts on either end. And then down below, we have these two brackets. And notice how it's braced up in here to the bottom of the sill, number four and five. It's the double sill close together because this is where you get the most uh, strain on the car. And uh, one end is bent up here and the other is bent down and then this is a bolt, a big square-headed old-fashioned bolt that went out through the front and had a nut on that held the bottom of the coupler on. So uh, the coupler and then it bolts up through the, the sill fastened on the top. It's well fastened, very solid. 100 is a pilot or otherwise known as a cow catch and it's fastened on to this brace here. There's one here and we saw one being made earlier, and that's on the other corner. There's a piece of wood that bolts right on here, and then there's another angle iron that comes out here that holds the bottom, and, the, and it comes out here. There's actually a board that you can stand on. This one is different from all the others. It's one and an eighth, eighth inches thick by six inches wide, a mighty solid piece of steel. The others are narrower and a little bit thinner. Uh, I don't know what happened when this pilot hit something because I would think it would tend to tear this whole thing off. It's fastened by two bolts going up through and then the pilot, the wood on here and so forth and there's more wood that goes on here but we'll see that later when the pilots are actually finished this summer. Well, that's it. There's a small problem, I don't know where you noticed that. <laughs> This is the end of the train line where it will then couple onto another car. When the locomotive is running by itself, the valve is shut off, no air can come out here. But when you couple onto a train, you have this hose with a, what they call a glad hand on the end, and then the next car would have a similar one that would couple to that. So that's screwed onto here, and this is what helps give you brakes in all the cars. Now, I don't know how much they use these because uh, the runs were very short that they made and they were coupling up and so forth and the crew probably got lazy. But having said that, if they were pulling a number of heavy cars, uh, they could, uh, if you didn't have brakes in every car and were going up any kind of a grade or down any kind of a grade and try to stop, they could just slide the locomotive right along because it, it doesn't have any uh, weights in it the way uh, some locomotives might. 